Hello once again. Thank you for joining us. This is the Space Nuts podcast with Andrew Dunkley, your host, and of course, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Oh, hi, Andrew. How are you doing? I am well, sir. How are you? Oh, you don't have to call me sir. It's quite all right. <laughs> oh, it's just a thing. It's just a thing I do. I, I can't help it, you know. It's must have been the way I was brought up. I can just imagine you at school. Sir, sir, sir. Oh, yes. We had to say sir at school. <laughs> well, we did too. That's that, right. that was the law. And Indeed. For, for the young whippersnappers that are listening in, uh, they had a thing at my school called the cane. Yeah, and I got it, the cane once. Oh, I got it a couple of times. I was naughty. <laughs> and it hurt. It hurt. Yeah. I, we actually had one teacher who had six canes and they all had different names. Oh, dear. And his oh, favourite was Mark IV because it was the whippiest <laughs> and it hurt the most. I never got that one. Never got that one. But, uh, oh, cruel <clears throat> and evil device. They've been outlawed now. Uh, now, Fred, today on the Space Nuts podcast, ep episode 231, we're going to look at the Million Star Survey from ASCAP, uh, Changi's uh, spacecraft, um, or the spa uh, Changi spacecraft, which they're looking to touch down on the moon this weekend, uh, wattle seeds in space. Uh, for those who are going, what, what, what are wattle seeds? What, what? Uh, they're acacia. That's their... Um, genus i think and audience questions we're going to knock off a few of these today if we can ralph wants to uh, give his idea of what the universe looks like uh damien is asking about space time and dark matter uh rk is uh, looking at gravitational waves and leandro uh, has a really great question i love this one why is there a black hole at galactic center <laughs> i don't think we've ever been asked why there's a black <laughs> hole at the center well why not? <laughs> because it's there. <laughs> because it's there. All right, well, we've, not, to it than that. we've answered that one. Um, <laughs> but first, Fred, let's uh, see if we can uh, sort out this million star survey. Uh, that's, uh, has it just been released? It has, that's right. Uh, and it, it, it's incredible, actually, uh, what's happened. So this is a story uh, that is about the ASCAP uh, radio telescope array in Western Australia. ASCAP is an acronym for Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinder and it's been operating now for, it's been operating in full for probably about, uh, about two years I think. Um, but one of the things that they have done <clears throat> is, um, is, a, is to carry out a survey of uh, of what you might call local galaxies. Uh, but I think these are local in the sense that they go up to several billion light years. Uh, and um, the, the bottom line is uh, the rapidity with which this survey has been done. Uh, because uh, they, the, the ASCAP uh, facility is unusual in that uh, these are radio telescopes, but they've got a kind of image sensor at their focus very like the well, analogous to the <coughs> image sensor on an optical telescope or on your phone for that matter. <coughs> These things cover an area, if I remember rightly, it's uh, about six, six degrees square, I Ooh. think I'm remembering, um, with pixels in them. And so what you have uh, is the ability to look at patches of the sky uh, and then you know, record everything that's in that, in that patch. Uh, and the, the essentially the bottom line is uh, just as we used to do with and still do actually with survey telescopes in visible light, uh, the bottom line is that you can survey the sky very quickly. Uh, and in fact, I think the uh, the, the the record uh, that's happened uh, is that they did is it three million galaxies in uh, three hundred hours. I think. Wow. That's the, Total. Let me check that. But, uh, you know, that's that's an astonishing rate of progress uh, for for the for, for, for the kind of telescope that we're talking about mm. here. It's really quite remarkable. That could make it into the Guinness Book of World Records. Uh, it probably is already. That's right. Maybe. <laughs> so um, let me just check the, uh, the, the the figures that we've got here. Uh, that survey was looking at 83 uh, percent of the entire sky. Wow, they, that's they amazing. Combined, yeah, they, they, well, that's the, the, the sky scene from, actually, no, that's probably right, 83%. Sounds a bit, uh, it means they must have gone very close to the northern horizon, mm. uh, but it 
sounds uh, possible. Um, three million galaxies, yes, in 300 hours. And they did it by uh, combining 903 images uh, to make this full map of the sky. Uh, whereas before you'd need tens of thousands of images of the sky with with radio, you know, with radio telescope surveys. So it's a great achievement. Um, <clears throat> the uh, final 903 images and supporting information is 26 terabytes of data. Uh, the images, uh, I think each image contains 70 billion pixels. So it's, you know, it's huge yeah. numbers and fabulous stuff. Uh, it's a great triumph, really, uh, for this uh, this radio array and, and really puts it on the map uh, in terms of what it can achieve. Uh, and of course, there are great things down the track. Mm. It's already famous, of, of course, Andrew, for um, uh, the, the, its work with fast radio bursts, which we've talked about before. The fact that it's, then again, it's this wide angle of view that lets you detect these things. And I assume this uh, million star survey will be a document that will be widely available to anybody who needs it for whatever purpose. Yep. Exactly, that's right. It'll, you, you can already uh, actually, uh, if you, you probably should Google the ASCAP survey or something, but you can already go to a site that's got a, a, a panoramic uh, viewer that will let you actually uh, take a virtual tour of the survey. Um, that's very, very nice. You just sort of scroll around on the, on, on your, with your mouse and you can see all these galaxies throughout the sky. Yeah. It's beautifully done. Quite amazing. Yeah, I saw some photos, I think it was on Instagram the other day and they, uh, I think there was one photo that says, you are looking at one million galaxies and I went, or was it three million or something? It was some extraordinary. <laughs> and, you know, when you first look at it, you think, oh, nice, nice photo of stars. No, they were all galaxies. Yeah, <laughs> mind blowing. Absolutely mind blowing. Hmm. Now, um, that's good news. Uh, the other piece of good news, uh, putting aside China's political uh, tensions and the yep. situations we're talking about in the news we, at the moment. We don't talk about that. No. Uh, but <laughs> no. Uh, Chang'e 5 is about to touch down on the moon. They, they sort of did a sneaky launch on us. Uh, yeah, in fact, it's already down. Oh, is it? Uh, oh, touched down in the small hours of this morning. That's wonderful. Right. Did it successfully? So we've got, um, you know, another step in this extraordinary mission, Chang'e Five, to to return two or th two or three kilograms of uh, lunar rocks and soil back to Earth by the middle of next month. Mm. It's all happening very quickly, uh, as you said. Uh, what really uh, impresses me about this is the. Technology, technological complexity of this mission. There's, you know, there's there's many many remote uh, dockings and and uh, or, sort of orbital rendezvous uh, and all of that sort of thing, all going on autonomously uh, out there in orbit around the moon. So the lander is down on the moon at the moment. It's built like the old space shuttle, sorry, the old um, lunar modules in the Apollo missions, in that the top half. Uh, comes back to orbit, uh, and, and the, the lower half is what uh, allows you to, to 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 land softly on the moon. It's got a rocket retro firing rocket to to slow down the descent, yep. land you safely on the moon. But then the top half separates uh, and goes back to orbit, hopefully with the samples in. We expect the samples to be gathered within the next couple of days. Right. So how are they? The how are they collecting them? Uh, there's a drill. Oh. <laughs> a drill a hole was, in the moon. I was either going to go with drill or scoop. <laughs> yes, and a, there's actually a scoop as well. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so you drill the hole and then you scoop it. Yeah, I can imagine yeah, when it all comes back, they'll go, oh, this is so exciting. Oh, it's basalt. <laughs> well, it is basalt. And uh, that is the interesting bit, though, because this is young basalt. Ah. Uh, the place where it's going is something called uh, Rumka Mons, named after... Uh, a famous scientist, I think, uh, <laughs> Rumka, uh, a German word. Uh, and um, that Mount Rumka is basically uh, a young basaltic outcrop. It's about 70 kilometers across. It's big. Mm. But the thinking is that this is much younger than the surrounding basalt, and indeed uh, younger than the basalt that was brought back by the Apollo astronauts in the 1960s and 70s. So uh, it, it's got really interesting uh, scientific outcomes from uh, potentially from the mission, but I think the, the technology is perhaps the the really astonishing bit. Just how what an achievement this yeah, is. It's it seems to be. I, I'm not, I'm I'm going to sort of understate it a bit, but it seems to be getting easier to do these things. And I suppose after fifty mm -hmm. odd years, it should be. Yes, that's mm -hmm. right. Uh, there's there's a bit more 
you know, our technology's moved on a bit <laughs> since the Apollo era. Indeed, it has. <laughs> but it's still, yeah, it's still a great achievement. Definitely, definitely. Another great achievement that we're going to touch on today is sending wattle seeds into space. Yes. Now, this has um, got a bit of a local spin on it, this, this story. But the giant leap, uh, the One Giant Leap Australia Foundation has um, uh, arranged all of this and uh, a bunch of schools, about 150 of them in Australia, will be sending wattle seeds into space as an experiment. Um, wattle is a, a plant that flowers every August in Australia, uh, early spring. Uh, beautiful native plant. Uh, it's a, a part of the acacia variety of, of trees and they have... Um, the flower is like a little yellow bauble and they, they build, they, they grow them in these massive clusters. And if, uh, if you're having a good season, all you can see is yellow from, well, I was going to say something I can't say, uh, from one end of the street to the other. They are just extraordinary trees, quite beautiful. Uh, but they're very short lived, as it turns out, Fred. But uh, one of their great benefits yeah, is yeah. that they, they are very, are good at um, enriching the soil, soil with nitrogen, I'm told, which is um, I believe which is a great true. benefit. But uh, this this is a terrific story, and um, one of the schools involved is the Central West Leadership Academy. I work just around the corner from that school uh, when really I'm on, in my other job, and um, this this is a big collaboration. A lot of uh, agencies involved in this one. Including the Australian Space Agency, yeah. that's right. Uh, the, um, it is, it's great. So the idea is to send these seeds uh, up to the International Space Station, um, and it's actually a collaboration with the Japanese Space Agency as well, JAXA, uh, that the seeds will uh, basically sit in space for six months, then come back to Australia in time for next year's Science Week, which is in uh, August. Uh, and basically uh, what... The schools will get is that wattle seeds that have flown and wattle in space and wattle seeds that haven't and the idea is to germinate them and see how they grow uh, and record the yeah. data and i love the, the the catchphrase there what will happen to the wattle oh i've, ne lovely. I've never heard that one before fred <laughs> sheer poetry yes, yes. but it'll, it, no it'll be interesting because uh, I think they've done similar experiments with other life, you know, uh, garden yep. life forms before, and and there has been significant differences in in their growth patterns. Uh, so yes, it right. will be fascinating to see what happens to a, a native Australian plant, uh, and uh, it will be very exciting for the students. Uh, we never got to do this kind of thing when I was at school. No. Um, I think <laughs> the, I think the most I ever got to do was keep silkworms and cut open a dead mouse. That was about it. <laughs> right. I, I, Good thing it was, yeah, it was very dead, and I put it back together afterwards too. I thought that was the right thing oh, to do. Well for the yes, next exactly. <laughs> and the scalpel was blunt. It was a terrible job. Horrible oh, job. Dear. It sounds awful. awful yes, awful. but... Uh, <laughs> That's why I, I, I did physics rather than biology. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think being able to get sort of involved in sending something into space, uh, it, it will be a talking point for years to come for these students. And uh, who knows what their kids will probably do in decades to come. Yeah, um, right. I, I, I envisage the day that uh, there might be an excursion to a space station. Who knows? Yeah, it's, it's all possible. possible. That's very, right. very possible. Yes, but good luck yes. to the kids and can't wait to see the results of that particular experiment. You're listening to and watching the Space Nuts podcast with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. This is the Space Nuts podcast, episode 231. Andrew Dunkley here with Fred Watson. And don't forget, uh, if you want to watch the podcast, it is now available as a vodcast on YouTube. So uh, just uh, look for, uh, it's, I think it's youtube.com slash Space Nuts or Space Nuts podcast. I can't remember now, but uh, it should be easy to find. All our uh, back episodes are there as well in audio form, but these uh, last few episodes uh, have um, been recorded in high definition video, so you can uh, you can watch us do what we're doing, which is basically sitting here talking to each other. It's really exciting <laughs> to watch people sit and talk, though. I mean, That's I've done it many many times. Um, oh, occasionally, we might even change our facial expressions, 
But uh, yes, Ooh. yes, um, especially when we bump the microphone accidentally, which I've done twice this yeah. morning already. But um, yes, uh, you can you can watch the uh, the vodcast on YouTube, or um, if you want to socialise with other uh, Space Nuts followers, you can do that at the Space Nuts podcast group on Facebook, and get together with other people and, and talk astronomy. And, and it's a very active group. I think there's somewhere around a thousand or more. Uh, members of the Space Nuts podcast group. We also have official channels on uh, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and so many others. So if you're social media, if you're a social media user of any particular ilk, uh, have a look for Space Nuts and you, you might well find us. Now, Fred, question time. Uh, we've got, um, we're going to try and knock off uh, four more questions today and do a bit of a catch up because we, we sort of had a, an avalanche of questions recently. This first one comes from Ralph and he's in Northern California. Hello, big nuts. <laughs> I propose that the universe is round. It's finite and round. Perhaps there are others, but ours at least is finite and round. There are no sharp edges in nature at the atomic level. Nothing is square. At the cosmic level, round planets revolve in mostly round orbits with round satellites around round stars within primarily round galaxies. Gravity itself dictates a circular motion. Outer shells of atomic structure suggest round orbits or waves of particle, neutrons and electrons circling around the proton. The strong nuclear force pulls into the center in a circular way. The weak nuclear force allows escapism to nearby circular orbits. Even magnetic poles display circular attraction from opposing charges. Then there's the circle of life, a circle of reasoning, cir circular breathing, circle of friends, the color circle, and in music, the circle of fifths. Why should the universe itself be any different? If it all came from a point of singularity, a big bang, and it's ever expanding, and despite the increasing expansion, why shouldn't we expect a spherically round cosmos? On a second note, since time is relative and the speed of light determines relativity, since everything is at a distance except our pupils, then everything is relative. How do we shoot a spaceship to a specific point on Mars when the light coming from Mars is 14 minutes late? Lastly, have you ever considered having special guests on the show? Not that Professor Watson isn't a rock star, he most certainly is. Just an interesting thought for mixing things up a bit. <laughs> this is Ralph from Northern California. Thanks as always to the astronomer at large, and the rock star science fiction writer host, Mr. Dunkley. <laughs> oh, Ralph, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think he's talking us in circles here. Yeah, look, it's that's um, the, the Ralph's um, first few paragraphs there are a marvelous rhapsody to isotropy, because uh, isotropy, the things being the same in all directions, is basically what he's talking about. And yeah, as far as we know, the universe is mm. isotropic. Um, it, it's it's the same in all directions. So you could interpret that as being round. Uh, but perhaps the more um, you know, the more interesting bit of the uh, of, of Ralph's. Um, uh, Rhapsody there is uh, how do we shoot a, sp a spaceship to a specific point on Mars when the light coming from Mars is 14 minutes late? That's a really good question. So um, space navigation is all about exactly this kind of thing that you uh, you have to take into account uh, the fact that there is a delay in signals going out. There's a delay in signals coming back. It's not always 14 minutes with Mars. It depends where Mars is on it whereabouts Mars is in its orbit. Um, but those, uh, you know, those delays are taken account of in the orbital calculations, but more especially with a process like um, landing a spacecraft on Mars, which we all know is very hard, uh, it, you, you, su you succeed 50% yeah, of the Mars time. Mars is very hard. <laughs> You can make well, a mess. That's right. It's a hard surface when you hit it. Um, but but it's uh, so it, you, it's all always done by aero braking. You know, you you have a heat shield which heats up and slows the spacecraft down. Then there are parachutes and all the rest of it. The bottom line is that's all got to happen autonomously. You can't just um, re rely on oh that bit's all right. We'll send the signal to release the parachutes or something like that. It's all got to yeah. happen automatically, and that's fraught with pitfalls. The uh, European Space Agency uh, sent a, it was a test probe actually, it's about two years ago now, it's called Schiaparelli, which was a little lander that was designed to test how their um, 
the Exo Mars lander will go, which I think is now scheduled for launch next year. It's delayed. But Schiaparelli, um, the, the software had a glitch in it. So uh, the system thought it was nearly on the ground. So it released the parachute and it was several kilometers up in the, up in the atmosphere. Uh, the parachute basically just floated away into the wide blue yonder and this thing hit the ground sure uh, faster than it was supposed to. So everything's yeah. got to work. Yep. <laughs> But great question yeah, from of Ryan. Course, Thank you very uh, much. <laughs> you know, that, that's all very complicated. The, the simplest thing to do would be to just hit the launch button 14 minutes, you know, before the zero count. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's right. But then you don't find out for 28 minutes whether you've Possibly. done the right thing. And yes. Oh, crap. Oops. Too soon. Missed that by yeah. one second. Or as, uh, yeah, as Get right. Smart used to say, missed it by that much. Yes. All right, uh, Ralph. Thanks for the yeah. <laughs> thanks for the question. Uh, we'll go now to uh, Damien Huxley, who's got uh, a question about something we've never ever discussed before: space time and space time and dark matter. Question about space time and dark matter. There you go. When we calculate the mass of the sun and the planets, does Newton's laws of gravitation and Einstein's equation of space time take into account? dark matter. I guess not since Newton didn't know about the dark stuff. So does that mean there isn't any dark matter in our solar system? Or it is included in the calculations. Then dark matter is 27% and normal matter is 5%. Is the sun, earth and us most mostly dark matter? Thanks guys for a great show, Damien Huxley. Thank you, Damien. Uh, gosh, the old dark matter question again, Fred. <laughs> but it's great. You know, th these are the really good questions about uh, why it is that there's only certain ways that we can determine what dark, how dark matter behaves. We yeah. still don't know what it is. Uh, yeah. it, and, and I think we're kind of possibly closing in um, on the... Well, it's actually maybe even you too know what they'll they'll find out. Uh, Fred. They will, and I've got personal experience with this. They will find out that all golf balls are made of dark matter. That's what they'll <laughs> that's what they'll find out. That's why they're invisible. <laughs> we can't hit them. Yeah. So, so it's because of the way galaxies behave that we believe dark matter is a reality. It's something that is present in the universe. Uh, it only reveals itself by its gravity. Um, it doesn't shine, it doesn't block light out, uh, so it doesn't really interact with photons and, in fact, with, with anything else, uh, the other normal, um, you know, the, the normal... Um, it's non-conformist. So non-conformist, or uh, you could call it exotic. <laughs> That's, a That's the, the word that, you know... Uh, I mean, it's mixing metaphors, that. I suppose there are some exotic Methodists out there, which is, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what you'd get to. Uh, anyway... Um, the, the the bottom line is that dark matter certainly in our galaxy is everywhere because that's how galaxies are, are, are made mm. how they're put together um and but it's uh it's distributed uh over very wide volumes and so if you've got a solar system that's immersed in this stuff and it's uniform throughout the solar system which we believe it is then you know, that's how, how Newton's laws can work in, in such an environment because the dark matter itself being just a kind of uniform background doesn't have any effect on it. Um, uh, it's only when you get to, to galactic scales that you start seeing the fact that galaxies, uh, you know, they, they must have dark matter because they're otherwise rotating too quickly. Um, so, so you can, yes, dark matter, we believe, is there and it's approximately that those um, uh, you know, ratios that, um, uh, that Damien mentioned, 27% uh, of the component of the unit. So it's roughly, it's, it's kind of roughly dark energy is 75% uh, is, uh, dark matters, 20% and normal matters, 5%. That's not quite right, but it's that sort of, uh, you know, that's the mass energy budget of the universe because mass and energy are equivalent. Um, so that's the thinking. But there are scientists, and I, I suspect in a way it's an increasing number, who are getting frustrated by the fact that we're not detecting what dark matter mm. particles are, and they're looking for other ideas. Um, 
uh, Mordechai Milgram was very early in this in the 1980s suggesting his theory of MOND, modified Newtonian dynamics that suggests that gravitation doesn't quite work at the low accelerate or the laws of motion don't work at the low, at the low accelerations that we see. That's not it doesn't work because it, it, it you know you, you lose other things if you if you put that in but there are some people who are looking at new and unusual forms of hydrogen or newly thought about unusual forms of hydrogen uh, and so it's possible that over the next decade our thinking might turn around completely on dark matter and it, it might be oh it's hydrogen oh. a different sort of hydrogen that's very much uh it's very controversial is that and a, certainly a minority view but um, I've seen a number of papers recently that, that are looking at that. So um, watch yes. this space. <laughs> uh, well, it's watch 95% like, uh, of it anyway. <laughs> yes, that's right. Well, actually, the 5% yes. well, well, that's we all see. we can see. And, and that's, that's where it gets <laughs> yes, so it extraordinary. Is. We can see all of this stuff, this amazing stuff around us, and it's only 5% of everything. I mean, that, that's, that's yeah. the mind-blowing part of it. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, it's quite, quite extraordinary. Um, how long, you know, ballpark figure, and this is this is a question without notice, but how long do you think it will take, if ever, for them to crack the dark matter and dark energy, dark energy puzzle? Um, so I think dark matter, the, the, the two yeah. are quite different, Andrew, and they've got similar names, and that's really bad. They should, you know, one should be given a different sort of name. Uh, dark energy is what, we think causes it the accelerated expansion of the universe that, that there's an energy of space itself that's pushing the universe apart ever more rapidly uh, and we really don't know what that is that's uh, quite a um, you know a difficult problem to crack i think that is the one that will take more than 10 years maybe 20 mm. years to figure out Dark matter I'm more optimistic of. I mean, I'm a bit less optimistic than I was a couple of years ago uh, because the big theory for dark matter was supersymmetry. Uh, that was a, you know, an, the idea in physics that every subatomic particle has got its supersymmetric shadow particle, which we don't see because it's hidden in some hidden dimension. Um, but uh, the Large Hadron Collider has explored the the energy levels that people have thought you might see supersymmetric particles and there's nothing there uh, up to 14 tera electron volts which is its operating energy um, so either these things are more massive than we thought they are or supersymmetry is wrong uh, and people that's why people yeah. are looking well at it, it helped it's 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 good to look outside what you think is right because you might be wrong and therefore <laughs> yeah that's exactly Yes, well, that's how science works. You you keep your mind open. Uh, you know, well, a lot of the time it's based on theory, and you do experiments to prove the theory right or wrong. And if it's wrong, well, you come up with yeah. something else and try again. Uh, it's sort of like playing darts. You just got to keep going till you hit a bullseye, <laughs> or whatever. Well, what yes, are you trying yes. to hit? <laughs> um, see see what you've done, yeah. Damien. <laughs> <laughs> it's all your. It's all your fault. It's all Damien's fault. <laughs> uh, no, but thanks for the question. Uh, very, very good. Uh, and um, yes, we will watch with interest. We might just have to hold our breaths for a very long time before these uh, issues are solved. Uh, this is the Space Nuts podcast. Andrew Dunkley here with, of course, Fred Watson. Okay, we checked all four systems and seeing with a go. Space Nuts. Thanks for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast, Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Of course, um, always good to have your company wherever you are, whenever you are. Uh, and uh, of course, um, you can visit the Space Nuts website, spacenutspodcast.com. And uh, you can you can do a lot of things there. Of course, uh, there's the Astronomy Daily tab where you can catch up on all the astronomy news that's uh, going around uh, at the present time. That gets updated so very regularly. And you may you may be on the email list. And if you're not, you can certainly sign up for it. Uh, there's the Space Nuts shop where there's lots of goodies that you can get for Christmas. Uh, the Space Nuts mugs. That's not me and Fred. That's space. That's actual mugs. Uh, there's also uh, Space Nuts shirts, polo shirts, stickers, uh, caps, etc. Uh, there's the Space Nuts bookshop and so much more. So check us out at spacenutspodcast.com if you'd like to um, 
um, just have a look around. You don't have to buy anything, but we'd really like it if you did. Uh, but, yeah, you don't have to buy anything. Uh, now, uh, oh, and, and if you do want to contribute to the uh, podcast, you can do that through um, uh, any of our uh, patron-like websites, patreon.com and supercast. Check them out. Uh, you, can, you can do that through the, the website as well. Uh, there's package deals through Supercast, or you can just choose what you think's a fair amount to pay us on a monthly basis um, at your leisure on patreon.com slash space nuts. But again, not mandatory. Uh, we, we're never going to tell you that it has to be done. Uh, so just a, uh, something to think about. Now, uh, we've got another question. Fred, this one uh, comes from, I think it's Aki or Ake in Orky in okay. Sweden. Let's okay. see what he's yeah. got to ask us. Sweden. Hello, my name is Åke and I'm from Sweden. I'm a keen follower of your show. Uh, I have a couple of questions regarding uh, gravitational waves. How can we be sure that gravitational waves that we detect originate from the collision of black holes and not something else with large masses? Uh, also, can we determine the location of the collision or or at least the direction to it? Thank you for a great podcast. Okay, thank you very much for your question. The answer is um, yes and yes. <laughs> it, it is. Um, I think maybe oh, I thought we covered it. That, I thought we but... covered it pretty well. <laughs> So, um, look, it's a great question, actually, and I'm very glad it's come up because we've, I don't think we've really explained mm. this that carefully. Um, we now have um, more than one um, gravitational wave detector in the world. Uh, the, the operational ones are uh, the LIGO, the large, inter sorry, the laser interferometric gravitational wave uh, observatory, which has two facilities in the United States. Virgo is another one in Italy. I think there might be others coming on stream as well. Um, India and Japan uh, ring bells with me, but I'd need to check on that. But um, the, so just going to the, the last part of Orca's question first, um, how can we determine the location of the collision or at least the direction to it? Yes, uh, you, the direction is better pinpointed when you have more detectors <clears throat> because you, yeah. you can sort of triangulate excuse me a moment <clears throat> sorry about that <clears throat> sorry orca it's all good sorry andrew coughing into the mic um yeah so so you you know the more detectors you've got the better your ability to determine the direction that it comes from and sometimes these things um have uh, essentially a, an electromagnetic counterpart as well and of course if you can pick that up with a radio telescope or a an X-ray telescope or even a visible light telescope, then you can pinpoint it uh, much more much more accurately. <clears throat> Going back, though, to how you know what it is that's colliding, it's really r remarkable the way this is done because when two objects, let's talk about black holes, for example, when two black holes collide, they don't just sort of charge into one another. They basically start off in a in an orbit around one another, which gradually gets smaller. They're mutually, actually, I'm on video, aren't I? So yes, I again. Do, I can do the hand motions. Uh, they're, they're, they're virtually uh, spiraling inwards. And as they spiral inwards, uh, just as my fingers are doing there, they get faster hmm. and faster until they merge. Um, and that process is what releases the gravitational waves. Now, what you see in the gravitational wave signal is... Um, uh, uh, it's essentially a wave uh, which gets more and more rapid in frequency. So you've got this wave whose frequency is increasing and, uh, and that gives you three parameters, Andrew. Um, it gives you, first of all, the frequency of the wave, the amplitude, that's how much the gravitational um, field is shaking, uh, and the, uh, the, the the rapidity with which it's increasing, in other words, the sort of acceleration as these two objects come together. And those three things are what let you tell what it is. It gives you the masses of the colliding objects. Um, it, it, once you get to anything above, say, 10 to 20 times the mass of the sun, you know it's going to be a black hole because that that's you know what what it has to be you you know the size of it is very small from the three parameters that i've just given 
uh, or the size of the colliding objects. Uh, so you can detect what it is, a black hole or a neutron star. Um, and that's raised puzzles, actually, because the, it looks as though there are neutron stars that are mm. more massive than we thought they could be uh, because they've been registered by these collisions. Uh, but it is, it's a, an intriguing process, uh, and it's done by by very accurate very computer models. Okay, uh, thanks, OK. I hope that uh, answered your question. Now we've got a question from Leandro in Argentina. Hello, I discovered your podcast some months ago, and I liked it immediately. Well, that's a first. Um, it's really easy it's to great. listen to and extremely <laughs> enjoyable. Well, thank you. Uh, I started from the first episode and I don't remember exactly where I'm at now, but I keep listening in um, a nice half hour of cool stuff and hosts. Uh, I usually start my day listening to you. That's lovely. Uh, I, I think I have a kind yeah, of great. comment and question at the same time. I usually hear scientists talk about the existence of a black hole at the centre of almost every galaxy, but I've never heard them explaining the reason for this. So I started thinking that the centre of a galaxy may be the place with more mass in it, and when you have a lot of mass concentrated in a reduced space, that may form a black hole in time. Well, that's the answer I got. And related to this, and as far as I know, our sun is responsible for all the planets in the solar system to stick together and not wander around. It's, uh, it's gravity. And I heard Fred some episodes ago saying, uh, so, uh, some episodes ago saying that they, they think the black matter or dark matter is responsible for keeping the Milky Way as it is and not getting spread out. That means the black hole at the center of the galaxy is not able to maintain gravitationally together all the bodies in our galaxy as our sun does with the solar system. That's it. Hope it wasn't too long. I'm going to take a breath now. Thanks for, um, thanks for every episode. <laughs> Lots of fun and uh, good information. Well, he's referring to something we probably said a couple of years ago, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> That's all right. And that's, that's quite all right. It's a great question. And, and actually, uh, Leandro's question is one that astronomers themselves ask. What, you know, which mm. came first, the galaxy or the black hole? Uh, and the thinking is that the, the, the black holes, um, partly because of the high density of matter, in the center of a galaxy. It's all about the way matter collapses on itself. And this is now in the early universe, uh, that high density of matter, uh, some stars which would have been very high mass stars, they um, blow themselves up and end up yep. forming high mass black holes uh, in the early universe. And the thinking is that, that there were collisions, just like what we've been talking about with Orca's question there, that black holes collide, they make bigger black holes and, um, over time, that means that you grow supermassive black holes. So it's a it's a an, an accretion process. The the galaxy and the black holes may well have formed together, uh, but the black holes grow within the centres of galaxies. Uh, and uh, it's it's not that well clarified. It's not that fully understood. But that's the thinking. It's um, you know we know that galaxies grow by gobbling up smaller galaxies. Our own galaxy's done that. We've seen evidence of that. Some of the work I've done in the past has pointed to uh, dwarf galaxies that have been gobbled up by our own galaxy. And so that uh, that's how galaxies grow. And uh, the thinking is that the black holes gl grow. You know simultaneously or, or concurrently with mm. that in the centers of the galaxies. Um, just going to the last part of, uh, of Leandro's question, um, it's actually that, the, yes, he's right. Um, without the dark matter in our galaxy, it would fly apart. That's absolutely true. But it's actually not the black hole in the middle that's the main gravitational body that's holding it together, apart from the dark matter. It's the whole galaxy. So our black hole in the middle of the galaxy is uh, for about 4 million solar masses, but the galaxy itself in normal matter is about 400 billion solar masses. So um, it's all of that, you know, that concentration of matter that uh, keeps it together, but it's not enough. That's mm. why we okay. have to have very good. Uh, thank you, uh, Leandro, for your question. It's prompted a question in my mind. We know that uh, our galaxy is ultimately going to merge with Andromeda. Does that mean ultimately their black yeah. hole and our black hole will crash into each other? Yep, 
probably um it, it may take some time because that collision will uh, you know they'll pass through one another and then they'll come back it'll be a, a long yeah. drawn out train wreck uh, but at some point down what the track would be the, the black effect? holes will probably merge that's right mm. of the train wreck on us um it, not that much actually because there's so much empty space there the sun will probably not collide with any other star there will likely be a burst of star formation so there might be supernovas going off that are a bit close for comfort but generally speaking it's not you know it's not well, as dire good. as people might think yeah because i just um, bought a new car yes, it's no i'm yes, kidding that's right. we always need i that. never bought never bought a new car <laughs> no, you, i can't no, afford a new you car, can't afford a new car. <laughs> definitely not um thanks for the question leandro now we've got uh, one more thing to do before we finish up today and it's a it's a follow-up to a question from snow in new zealand last week and he's he's um he's just sort of uh, I guess taken us to task on something. Hey, Fred and Andrew, thanks for answering my question about the Earth's yeah. magnetic pole. I understand about the compass south needle marked as north, but if you float a magnet on a cork, as you mentioned, uh, the north pole at the magnet point toward, uh, points towards the north pole of the Earth. I've done this with an industrial magnet with the poles marked and have checked their um, magnet with a uh, halo effect transistor um, or hal effect Transmist, uh, transist hall effect it's, yeah. it's, uh, uh, hall to effect make sure the poles I mean. are yeah, marked correctly. Effect, yeah. The only other thing I can mention and don't know uh, where uh, is where does the positive charged ions from the solar wind go, north or south magnetic pole of the Earth to create the northern or southern lights. Thanks again, Snow from New Zealand. He's really putting a lot of thought into this. He's, <laughs> it's, it's kept him, it's kept him yeah, awake at night. I know and he's that. right too. <laughs> so snow you're right absolutely right um uh so i got it the wrong way around when we were talking last time about this i said that you know the north pole of the earth uh pulls magnets uh the compass magnet to the north because really the north pole of the comfort magnet com compass magnet not comfort magnet compass magnet is actually uh -huh. the south pole but it's the other way around the north pole the north magnetic pole of the earth has the polarity of a south magnet, magnet, aye, magnetic aye, aye. pole. Work that one out. So what we've been calling the North Pole uh, forever, mm. it's only called the North Pole because it's in the north, but it's actually a south magnetic pole. And then the, the, the other issue with the positive uh, and negative ions, um, we're talking there about electrical charge rather than magnetic charge. So they all stream down the magnetic field lines. Uh, of the Earth. Uh, that's how we get the aurora. Uh, both the electrons and the protons beam in towards the poles. They, they do it in a rather Fantastic. complex way. All right. There you go, Snow. You were right. And that. <laughs> yes, he was. Good. He was right. We stand corrected <laughs> and we're happy to do that. Uh, it, uh, actually, for, because he's come back to me, uh, I was going to tell a story last week and I completely forgot, uh, but we, we talked about making compasses out of needles and corks and floating them in water. I did that as a kid. I remember one Sunday morning, mum and dad were still in bed and I thought, I'm going to have a crack at this. So I got a magnet and I magnetised one tip of the needle and I stuck it in the carpet and I went and got a cork. And when I came back, I just planted my hands on the carpet and the eye of the needle went yeah. right in there, didn't hit the bone. Didn't right. hit the bone, didn't come out the other side. But I didn't, oh, you know what, didn't bleed, which says a lot about me. But um, no, yeah, no, and it missed the nerve, so I didn't even probably. feel any pain. I just went, ah, and pulled it out. It was just one yes, strange but thing. You did. <laughs> but um, yes, great way to finish. Well, Although a couple though. of times when I've given blood and they've put the needle in, this is really freaking some people out, I suppose. But um, I've never, I haven't felt it. So there, there must be gaps in the nerves in, hum, in the human body. Mm. Uh, if you can find those, that's where you stick the needles in. <laughs> yes. Enough of that. Uh, thank you so much <laughs> to everybody who contributed uh, all those questions. Keep them coming in. Don't forget you can send your questions to us via text service um, through our uh, website, spacenutspodcast.com. There's a, um, a, an email thingy there. Uh, that's its official name, email, email thingy. Uh, or you can click on the AMA tab and record your uh, question. Don't forget to tell us who you are and where you're from. And uh, we'll get as many answered as possible. We've been doing a bit of a catching up of late, and it's good to be able to do so many questions and hear your voices. Thanks again. And thank you, Fred, as always. Great pleasure. Uh, good to see you.
Good to talk Indeed, to you. Indeed, we will. Yeah, you too. Uh, Fred we'll Watson, you astronomer at large from the Space Nuts team <laughs> yeah. and from me, Andrew Dunkley. Thanks again for listening. We will catch you again real soon. Bye-bye. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.